actually, I've got an attachment with it now or something. <laughs> so, um, in the good old days, kind of at Codemasters, uh, we did do a lot of brainstorming, but we very rarely did what I would call technical brainstorming. So we would get people in and we would basically just be the design group and we'd talk about, okay, what are we going to do, what's the game going to be, and you know, how are we going to build this? Um, and it kind of worked, uh, and then what we would do is we would then go and tell the team what we're making. There are two problems with that. One, the team doesn't feel empowered, and two, how do I know whether a certain feature is going to be able to be done in a certain amount of time with the technology we have? And it's very obvious in retrospect, but at the time it was like, hey, here's the game design doc, throw it over the, over the wall, and then they're like, what's this? What do I do with it? So a good practice is to basically bring the specialists in while you're brainstorming. Bring the engineers in, bring the artists in, find out whether the, the ideas that you're talking about can be done. Find out if there's simpler ways of doing it or more cost-effective methods. And remember, I mean, this is really obvious, you hear this all the time, but it's called a team for a reason. How many designers I've worked with who basically just go off on their own um, and design something crazy, and then you just have, like, completely unbelievable looks from the rest of the team going, you know, this isn't what we're supposed to be making. Um, and again, it's very important in terms of empowerment for the team that we do work as a group, and never forget that the stakeholder who's paying the wage for the team is paying it to the team not to the individual, and there's a reason he does that, and that's because work done by a team tends to be more productive and useful. So, empowerment through communication, I've kind of gone through all of that now. The, this like, diagram that I saw on the internet is really interesting. It requires a little bit of thought, and perhaps I'm going down the wrong avenue with it, but I'm a strong believer in communication and partnership, and generally what communication does is it basically solves, it finds solutions to problems. And especially in the games industry, problem solving is extremely important. And the reason it's extremely important is because it provides balance, which then leads to a kind of team spirit and the team working in a unison on a focused direction. So just to recap, the nexus is basically all the information coming in, you looking at it, working out what we can and we can't do. And we have like quite a wide variety of areas that we could go down or areas that we could focus on. So the next phase for the designer is kind of like the architect. Um, so you've got this big bag of ideas, and everyone's like, oh my goodness, it's going to be the best thing ever. And then the producer turns around and goes, yeah, well, it'll be finished in 2034 or something like that. Um, so what do you have to do? Well, you get the relevant people, um, and you have to act as though you're the customer and stakeholder. And to be honest, the best thing to do at this stage would be actually to present this to the, to the stakeholder and say, here's uh, game A, here's game B, and here's game C and let them look at the different versions of it and so on, and then filter that through to make sure that one, budgets are going to be met, and two, direction is still correct. Mitigate risk at this stage. So you've been with the specialists, you've been through all the different things that you're going to do, you're going to realize these features. Try to cut development debt at this point. Try to think through and solve any problems before you actually start building anything. Keep the vision. Um, uh, I guess that... Again, old school days, there used to be this kind of image of there'd be one vision keeper kind of thing, and he would know exactly what's going on and what we're doing. But team sizes are growing and growing and growing, and that just really isn't working anymore. Um, so what we try to do, or what I try to do, is have multiple vision holders, have people all on the same page. And I guess the ultimate situation to be in is when everyone on the team is talking from the same page. Right, and now this, is, this might be a little bit controversial. When I started at, at Codemasters, after I'd been through QA and I was in design, we were, like, we were crazy. We were like designers on crack. We would basically write 80-page documents telling engineers how to program the game and how to build all these systems. Um, and we'd basically pass them over to uh, the engineers and they'd just look at it and go, you know nothing about maths and uh, why have you given me this document? So there's a different way of looking at game design, and it's a two-part solution. Um, and so the way that I like to go about doing it, and it seems to work very well with our team, is that you don't tell people how to program the game. You don't tell people what art they're going to put in. Instead, you build a manual for the game um, so that you basically, it's like an instructions manual that you get with a product. You know all the different aspects of it. You know what you want the features to do, um, and it doesn't really uh, uh, drill deep into the actual uh, execution of it. And so we go into the development stage, and this is connected to the last point. 
represent the design. So that doesn't just mean run around like an idiot telling everyone what the game's going to be. What it actually means, and this, funnily enough, is something that I learned uh, at an earlier company, is once you've provided the manual, work out when people are working on stuff and go and sit down with them. Um, work towards solving problems with them. Look at different, uh, more effective ways of dealing with stuff. And, and people might say, okay, but that's going to blow your schedule. If you basically say, well, how long has that person got? Five or six days. Then do it within those five and six days. Commit to that. And again, get the information from the relevant person who's the specialist. And this is something I believe in uh, very much as well. And it's something that's very commendable for VFS. We've had uh, two uh, students come from VFS this year. And uh, fortunately, they've been schooled in uh, Unreal, uh, the Unreal editor. They've basically hit the ground running. They're in the game. They're balancing. They're putting vehicles in. I'm not giving too much away there, I hope. Um, basically, they're doing all this cool stuff. Um, and they're actually realizing the vision of the design themselves, as opposed to you know, barking at people, telling them what to do, and then getting something back that they never expected to. So for the designers on our game, it's very much about developing the tools and the systems, and then going in there and actually doing the work yourself. And the biggest, coolest thing about this is you take pressure off the engineers. You're not constantly going over to them and asking them to fix stuff or to basically help you put this new feature in. So we are a very data-driven design department. So proactively focused test. If I've got time, I'll tell you an interesting story. Um, this doesn't mean necessarily go and do focus testing, although on the product that we have, we focus test pretty much once a week. Um, what it really means is listen to people when they're telling you stuff about the game. If you hear someone say something once, think about it, spend time thinking about it. If you hear someone saying something twice, there should be a red flag. If you hear it three times, there's something wrong. Okay, so I'll give you an example of this. I'll put my, my heart on the table. So uh, about five years ago, I was uh, the game director on a product called Pursuit Force, for those who've played it or heard of it. Um, and uh, it was a really, really good game. And we were coming up to finaling. Uh, and we only had two designers. It was a team of 22 people. And we didn't do any focus testing. So I'm there playing the game all the time, doing the balancing. Uh, everything was fantastic. And uh, I went away for a few days. I was called away. Uh, and I came back. And the whole team was like, this game is too hard. It's unbelievably hard. And I, I was thinking, well, you know, I know more about this game than anyone else does. And I know that basically the difficulty is all right. So here's the, here's the, the moral of the tale. Um, Pursuit Force is probably the hardest game on PSP. Uh, and it got really good reviews, but uh, there was one review from one website that said, uh, this game is for you if you like crushing glass and rubbing it into your hands. <laughs> so listen to what people say. And you know, just to go a little bit further than that, to show you the damage, essentially, that was done by me not listening to these people proactively, the second game that we brought out, Extreme Justice, was Pursuit Force 10 times better. Difficulty settings, everything was in there. But we'd already basically spoiled the experience for the, c the consumer. Their expectations had been lowered, and they'd started looking to other product, which meant that we didn't sell as much as we should have done on the second game. So it's kind of the gift that keeps giving in a bad way. <coughs> Problem solving. And for those who don't know what this is, a little bit of England there, it's the Italian job. OK? Um, this is something that everyone should have, but it's key. It's the most fundamental aspect of a game designer, is to be able to problem solve. You don't want to be a game, the type of designer that when someone comes over to you and says, this part of the design, the logic is broken, who basically puts his headphones on, gets angry, and ignores it. You have to solve problems. You have to see problems as a good thing and not a bad thing. And then finally, course correction. Uh, this can be very difficult for um, developers. You're, because you're so deep in, um, you're drilled down in the product you're making, you're essentially a submarine, you know, 100, 200 foot under the water. And when someone comes over to you and says, I don't think this is the right direction for the product, it's very hard to turn around and go, well, yes, actually, you're right. Let's scrap all the work we've done there, and let's move over to here. But the fact of the matter is, as soon as you deep dive and, you cert and you're basically under that water, you can end up 6,000 nautical miles in the wrong direction. So you need to be constantly checking and course correcting. And the way you do that is through focus testing, polling your team, and listening to your stakeholder. So finally, this is something I learned um, when I came over to North America. Um, we'd been making racing games for a long time. In fact, Pro Race Driver 
was actually designed to be a game that would break North America for Codemasters. Um, and we made it, and it got really good reviews in the UK, and it didn't sell in the US. And you know, we had not really no idea why. And it was when I came over here um, and started working uh, with Electronic Arts, for example, and then Propaganda, that it really kind of clicked uh, that we, for a certain amount of time, and Grid is an, and is, is an example of a game that's actually going in the right direction, but for a certain amount of time, we were so heavily into the product, so very heavily British, and so kind of very heavily uh, specialist in what we were creating, we just didn't have a big enough market, or we didn't have a product that was interesting enough for America. For example, we had no sexy ladies with flags and hip hop music and all that kind of stuff, but that's really important, you know? That's the difference between Grid and Need for Speed. One sells 18 million units, the other one sells two and a half million units. 